You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at the options Insider. Insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. everybody that music can mean only one thing it is interview tuesday here on the old options insider radio network time for our interview program here the portion of our broadcast week where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you the listener my name of course mark longo from the options as well as of course from the aforementioned network glad to see so many of you have been joining us day in, day out on the network. Most days, a couple of the shows hitting you a day out there on the network. Remember, if you like what you hear, particularly in these troubled times here of 2020, we've seen so many new people entering the stock markets and the options markets looking for guidance, looking for information. So if you want to help point them in the right direction, keep those reviews coming on your platform of choice. We do love to see the influx of new people who have been joining us throughout the year. Let's keep it going. Keep those reviews going on your platform of choice. Keep those questions coming, too. Maybe you have a guest you'd like us to feature on the Options Insider radio program. You know where to find us at Options on most of the major social media platforms. Head on over to the website or the app where you get our shows. You know how to reach out to us. Keep those questions. Keep those comments coming. We do love to hear from you guys. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old Options Insider radio program. Today, we have a great guest, someone most of you are probably familiar with Mr. Jack Schwager. He's the author of one or two tomes. Let me just list a few of them here, listeners, and see, see if you recognize these. Of course, the seminal tome, the tome that I blame for getting me into these options markets. Oh, those many years ago, Market Wizards, followed, of course, by Hedge Fund Market Wizards, a little book of Market Wizards, the new Market Wizards, getting started in technical analysis, Schwager on futures. We have the complete guide to mastering the markets, market sense and nonsense, futures, fundamental analysis, a complete guide to the futures market, which I believe is lurking somewhere here on my desk, of, right around here in the studio here. And then he has a second edition of that book as well, as well as a new book we're going to get into and a whole bunch more. And that's not enough. He's also the co-founder over there at Fun Cedar. Mr. Schwager, welcome back to the Options Insider Radio Network. Thanks, Mark. And Jack, I was looking here at my notes here from our producers, and it looks like the last time you and I chatted, it's been a while, it was back on our Trading Tech Talk program, way back in the early days of January 2017. Seems like a lifetime ago. Just January of this year now (laughs) seems like a lifetime ago. So maybe let's start there. Obviously, 2020 a bit of a tumultuous year. Uh, how are you and your family? How is everything holding up here during this, this year of tumult that is 2020, Jack? Oh, we're all fine. Thanks. Appreciate it. And of course, the last time you were on, way back in the, the early days of 2017, you were just in the process of launching an interesting new venture known as Fun Cedar. Obviously, we have a few more years under our belt now over there at Fun Cedar. So let's start, maybe catch up some of our audience who aren't familiar with it. What is Fun Cedar? And then uh, how have those new funds you've been finding and those new traders, how has all that fared in the intervening years since we last chatted here, Jack? Okay, sure. So <clears throat> Fun Cedar, basic concept was to create a central spot on the web where traders worldwide could link their, you know, who felt they were, well, actually, they may just want to analyze their performance, or they may be want to do that, and they may have hopes of perhaps managing money. Um, So uh, the site allows anybody anywhere to link their brokerage account uh, to the site. Not every broker 
uh, you know, is part of it. But for those brokers that are, and for other brokers, people can uh, upload their their data on our temp- Excel template sheet and uh, still use the site, although they would then manually have to update it, where if it's linked, it updates daily. And the idea for us was to, uh, we provide all the other site for free. It provides uh, stuff like equity, equity charts, underwater charts, other types of charts, all sorts of performance metrics, explanations, definitions of the performance metrics, the ability to do technical analysis on your equity curve even, you know. So, I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to run an experiment and say, hey, every time if my account went down 5%, I stopped trading and I didn't restart until it bounced back 3%, what would that look like as a chart with performance metrics compared to my actual account? So you can do stuff like that. And what we're looking – our goal is to find undiscovered trading talent. And we're now in the process – you know, the early part of the uh, – company was basically just creating the site for traders, uh, creating an index uh, based on those traders. And uh, now the the plan was to then uh, partner with a uh, major allocator and uh, who could then use that data. And we're currently uh, in negotiations with with two very large allocators, uh, which I can't say because we're currently in negotiation, but hopefully one or both will work out. And so that's where it all is. And as far as finding trading talent for the traders in a new book did come through Fundseeder. I kind of suspected there might be a little bit of interplay between the the new book (laughs) and the platform there, Jack. Well, you, you touched on it. So let's get to the new book. Of course, a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with Market Wizards and the entire Market Wizards series. Of course, the original one, I've mentioned it on the network in the past, is one of the things that really lured me to the dark side of options. You had one option guy lurking in there, Mr. Tony Saliba, who's been on the network many times, of course, uh, in the intervening uh, years. And that, that slowly lured me to the dark side of Chicago and the, and the trading pits. And now, of course, uh, this network here. Well, you, you weren't content to rest on your laurels with the Market Wizard series here, Jack. You've got a new edition just hitting uh, the virtual shelves as we speak back early November, November 3rd, uh, if I'm correct here. The new title, Unknown Market Wizards, the best traders you've never heard of. And it sounds like, Jack, like you just mentioned, this is very much in keeping with some of your recent efforts to unearth this new trading talent. So walk us through this latest edition to the Market Wizard series, sir. Yeah, so the last uh, the last Wizards book was uh, written in 2012, and that was Hedge Fund Market Wizards. So um, this is going exactly the opposite direction, which is uh, just solo traders who are kind of just trading on their own, uh, have long records, have done phenomenally well, and nobody knows them. And, you know, for the one or two who may, may – one trader is known because in the last few years he's built a large Twitter following – uh, but by and large, uh, uh, the traders are completely unknown, and uh, that's what I was looking for. And it was also, as you said, kind of a tie into Fun Cedar. Uh, the Fun Cedar, when we first formed the site, one of the things we we indicated that we would, I would eventually do a Wizards book uh, using the site to find traders, and so. There is that direct connection. Walk us through some of these new additions to the Markets Wizard series. Is there any commonality you found amongst them? Are they all, let's say, for example, pretty much long equity type guys? Or is there a little bit of a mix of products and asset classes? What kind of new wizards and participants are we getting in the new book here, Jack? Yeah, like in the other wizard books, there's a mix. You know, it's about, I'd say, maybe a little more half futures FX and uh, almost half uh, equity. So it's... It's nearly equally divided. Uh, the, the future section, I think, is no longer. Uh, and uh, the trading, uh, the traders are kind of lots of different methodologies. In fact, uh, it's so much so that one trader in his book has a methodology that I never even considered within the universe of possible trading. So I always, I always took it for granted that uh, everybody I was going to interview was either using some sort of fundamental analysis or some sort of technical analysis, or some combination of the two. I, in my mind, didn't conceive of a, a universe that you know, that wasn't 100% of. So it turns out that I found a trader for this book who 
neither uses uh, fundamentals nor nor technical at all. And so uh, uh, that was kind of, uh, you know, so there were some really interesting different approaches. One, another trader is a uh, pure contrarian, uh, which is, I've had one other trade I can think of that was kind of contrarian, but he's maybe the most so of all, all the people I've interviewed. And so you get uh, you get some very different uh, approaches. There are traders who just trade like events and uh, a large position, prepare very well for them, and have a real uh, strong edge in in uh, anticipating and executing on how markets will react to certain events. Now, you mentioned a few of these new market wizards came through the Fund Seeder platform, so you're able to obviously clearly evaluate and see what they're up to. How did you go about finding the others? I can imagine you've been doing the Markets Wizard series for so long now. You're probably just inundated with pitches on a regular basis. Hey, Jack, I'm a new Market Wizard. So is that how you found the rest? Or how do you go about unearthing these previously unknown Market Wizards, Jack? Yeah, Mark, it's a pretty good guess. Um, two of the traders in the book uh, did communicate to me. You know, one telling me about their his record, which sounds quite unbelievable. I kind of told him at that point that, I wasn't doing a book, but if I did, I would get back to him. And I was, you know, and I did like a half a year later, nine months later, the started to do the book, and I got back to him. Another uh, is a, one of the traders uh, wanted to meet me on, you know, talk to get some advice and talk over a project. And, you know, I said, if you want to fly out to Boulder, which was uh, where I met, well, I was at that time of the season, um, you know, uh, by all means. Uh, actually, uh, another trader was coming to Boulder. A third, so a third person was was coming to Boulder. Had read my book, uh, got him into the business, which was you know happens a lot of times. And figured he's going to Boulder for a wedding. Would I be willing to meet with him? And uh, and so I met him that way. Interestingly enough, he did not want to be interviewed. And I had this conversation with him was that was so compelling. I called when I was doing the book. I got back to him about five six months later. I said, look, you know. I think you've got you know, great material there. I think it'd be perfect. And after a couple of tries, I finally got him to go. So there's three people who the first contact came from them for various reasons. And then I, uh, I knew like I, I knew some people like uh, uh, like Peter Brandt, who's the one kind of uh, one person who who did have a profile because of his Twitter account. And so multiple ways. Oh, yeah, I've got the most important, not the, not the most important, but certainly responsible for all the other traders beyond the methods I just cited. And that is I tweeted that I was doing a new book and said, if, you, if you're a market wizard or no one and have a track record of over 10 years with exceptional return risk or compound the return, you know, let me know. And so I got many hundreds of responses and a few of those led to interviews. You know, it's funny. One of the first things I learned when I walked on the floor of the SIBO many years ago, I'm sure you probably encountered something similar, is that the people who are most forthcoming about how much money they're making are usually pretty much full of it. And those are the guys you have to kind of just dismiss all of their claims about how profitable they are, about how great their trading crowd was or their trading skills, whatever it may be. So I learned that fairly quickly in the business. I'm sure you probably have something similar, Jack, where when people reach out to you and you must get just extremely outlandish claims, I would think, on just a daily basis out there. How do, you, how do you go about filtering those folks? Is it pretty much just first off, I need to see results, or do you even just, like I used to do, just dismiss some of these outlandish claims outright? How do you go about whittling down the, the legion of responses there, Jack? Yeah, when I did the, well, when I did the book, I first of all, you know, out of the many, many hundreds, there were, you know, you weed them out in different ways. Some, you know, there were a lot of responses. Apparently, I I must have a huge fan base in India. So there were a tremendous amount of people, you know, even a couple hundred just on Indian traders alone. And although I had planned, there was one recognition I had for an Indian trader who was somebody who made billions from nothing. And that was, but with, with COVID, I ended up, you know, uh, you know, not doing that because obviously I wasn't traveling. Uh, so that would, so, but all the others, I just, that people wouldn't be interested in Indian markets so much, and uh, and I had this one one trader out of that group. But uh, you know, other than that, when when people look like, first of all, a lot of records are just too short. A lot of people, well, you know, they 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 have simulated records, which I say, I'm sorry, I can't use. But then when you get it down to those which are long enough, and it sounds like they're really good, then I basically ask for statements. And I'm curious, you've 
created this whole series of Markets Wizards. You profiled dozens, if not hundreds, uh, of different people out there across asset classes, across markets. As you've analyzed these and crunched the data over the years, have you noticed any maybe commonalities that you find that kind of bridge across the different gaps? Or are they all very much distinct personalities into and unto themselves and there's no real commonality, no real traits, no real lines running through all of them that maybe our listeners can hear and kind of grab onto and say, oh, maybe I should emulate something like that. Sure. Well, first of all, there's a clear distinction here. Uh, there is no similarity or commonality when it comes to personalities, right? They're, they're all over the place. They're, they're aggressive people. They're shy people. They're, they're white, right-wing people, left-wing people. Uh, there are people who are very fit. There are people who you know, look like they haven't gotten off the couch for four years. So, you know, it, it runs the gamut, all right? So there's no no commonality there. Uh, as far as methodologies, pretty much no commonality. Uh, you know, almost everybody is different from everybody else, not only in this book, but in every Market Wizard book. So, you know, some, they all have developed their own distinct type of methodology. So no commonality there. But where there is commonality is on the you know, kind of psychology side of it and trait and mental mental state type of uh, thing. So uh, one big thing, and not only that, but also uh, two things that I would say right up front, which is uh, risk management and discipline. So all, just about every trader I interview who's done extremely well uh, has has enormous respect for risk management focuses on that to uh, an extreme extent, uh, will often attribute more of their success to the risk management side than the methodology. Uh, they're also, you know, traders by and large tend to be very disciplined because you need the discipline to, to follow the risk management. You need it to stick with, stick with the exact methodology you define. Um, of course, everybody has to have an edge or else they, they wouldn't be winning. So it's not only developing a methodology – but it has to really have an edge. And what I, mean, what I mean by edge, it's sort of, you know, on a return risk basis, is generating equity without uh, un, un, unacceptable types of drawdowns. Uh, and people get to a point where they have confidence that their approach has an edge. And those are the people I'm, I'm basically interviewing. Uh, there are other traits, like they, for the most part, tend to be pretty hard workers. Uh, flexibility is extremely important. If you're the type of person who's dogmatic, uh, I think that's a real drawback to being successful as a, as a trader. And Jack, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the asset class and indeed the markets that have taken the world by storm since your last appearance here. Of course, I'm talking about all things Bitcoin and crypto. Are there any crypto traders in the new unknown market wizards tome? And if not, what are your thoughts on this new and indeed still emerging and nascent marketplace, sir? Uh, no. Well, there's one one trader who, uh, you know, as an adjunct, has also traded crypto. But he was, you know, there's some discussion of that in the chapter. But he's not a crypto trader. He's uh, he's a long only equity trader, preferably micro caps, uh, even which is getting a little more difficult because he's gotten so much bigger. You know, he's gone from yeah, I think now he's probably up to eighty or hundred million. Uh, but he started out with twenty five hundred, so. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, no crypto and, and, and I don't have any, I don't really have an, I mean, I could argue either side. I could really, I could argue why it's all going to end badly and I could argue why it's going to go to, you know, uh, at a, you know, who knows where. So I don't know which, which scenario is true. And, um, I'm just not, I'm too old to start a new, you know, I, I you know, I just don't. I don't have a great interest in it, and nor do I have a burning de- desire to get up to speed on all the intricacies and in it. And the dangers are there. Or it's not like in regular markets, you know. You're dealing with you're dealing with different issues, like you know, people hacking the uh, these uh, sites that uh, that facilitate the uh, you know uh, that hold that hold the Bitcoin and. Uh, the possibility of government intervention. And there's all sorts of things that really don't fall into the scope of traditional investing. I'll tell you, you know, my thought was, you know, I was more skeptical. And my thought was that when he wanted to announce futures, I said, gee, when it comes easier to go short here, it's probably just going to break. So I remember that opening night, 
I had it on my screen, and you know, it was near. Of course, I didn't know then it was near a high, but I was like, just I was trying to decide whether to short or not, and and then I said, no, who knows where this thing can go anywhere? Where the hell do you put a stop on something like this? So I just passed it up. But that that I that thought was actually correct when they started trading futures. It didn't it didn't indeed top. Uh, now it's come back again. I think a a big thing is PayPal uh, making uh, you know making it possible to hold Bitcoin. So that's an enormous thing that changes the game. Um, so now I don't know where I stand. On. You know, it's interesting. You've obviously devoted a lot of time to what you term the democratization of the markets there, of course, with Fund Cedar and with this new book, The Unknown Market Wizards, profiling some of the unknown, lesser heralded names out there in the trading space. We've certainly seen a similar trend just in the broad trading landscape of 2020. We've seen what many people have termed this retail explosion. We've certainly seen it in the options markets, but it's not limited to there. The stock markets, just about any marketplace you could think of has seen this explosion of some people are calling the one lot traders, the, the Robin Hood traders, call them what you will. They're out there. They're in mass as a result of staying home and the pandemic, maybe having a little bit more time or a little bit more inclination to follow the markets, whatever is causing it. It is certainly a demonstrable effect out there in the markets in 2020. I'm curious for a guy like you, Jack, who spent so much time trying to democratize this market. So what are your thoughts on this just retail explosion that we've seen just upending everything in the markets here in 2020? Well, I don't necessarily think it's good. Um, you know, you had a, yet a retail explosion probably back in the uh, internet bubble of the uh, second half of the 1990s. And um, they're like, you know, there's a, I forget who said it or, or if it's just unattributed, but it's the, it's basically don't confuse uh, brilliance. Uh, don't confuse a bull market with brilliance. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's the concept. So uh, people get enamored with the markets when things are kind of rolling along and it looks like it's easy to make money. And it may be for certain periods of time, but usually it doesn't end well. So, um, I, you know, I think if somebody's a retail trader and they've done the preparation and they've got proper risk management and uh, they've got a well, you know, well-defined methodology and stuff like that, yeah, fine and good. Uh, but if uh, if people are just jumping on it because it seems like an easy train ride and a way to get rich quick, like I say, it usually doesn't end well. Interesting. I thought maybe you'd be leaning the other way, that just this broad embracing of the markets um, and just general market interest uh, might be a good thing. But it sounds like you think a lot of these hordes out there are just kind of swinging for the fences. And we certainly have seen uh, some examples of that looking at the options landscape. A lot of people piling into upside calls and Apple, for example, and Tesla and all the names you might expect, probably without a lot of real understanding or indeed risk management, as you term it. So it sounds like you're more concerned about these folks getting in over their heads than you are about the the opening up of the markets to a, a new generation, a new era of people trading, Jack. Yeah, I, I mean, I look uh, at the actually the very conclusion of this book. I the last point I make is that the world is divided in two two types of traders slash investors. You know, uh, one is those who have you know, a passion for the market and, uh, you know, really have devoted time to developing a methodology, as I said, have risk control and do do have a reasonable chance of of doing maybe better than indexes and uh, and really love. It's a it's a passion for them. And I should add that I am a strong disbeliever in the efficient market hypothesis. And the book you mentioned, Mark's Market Sense and Nonsense, is in it as an entire chapter with maybe a dozen uh, explanations of why the efficient market hypothesis is wrong. Now, having said that, for most people, and you know, people who are just you know, taking tips from their brother-in-law or uh, just uh, you know uh, watch a TV show and pick up uh, a tip, or uh, just uh, you know their neighbor tells them something, or they you know they're just taking they're taking a shot, they're taking. They're taking shots. They're almost gambling more than they're doing any uh, methodical type of trading. For those people, their best advice is actually to act as if the efficient market hypothesis was correct. Uh, that is, you know, 
to put your money in an index fund, uh, a low cost index fund, and leave it there for 20, 30 years. Because those people don't have any edge. In fact, their edge is probably negative, and the odds are they're going to end up losing. So it really depends which which world one is in. And uh, so for those who fit the first description, by all means, you know, and, I, and if I, and that's who I'm writing primarily for. The other people I also write for in terms of just being, just having better knowledge and also getting the stories about it, which they may still be. It's interesting from a human, human uh, character side, but, uh, but I don't advise people who don't do enough work and don't have the methodology to be traders. Uh, it's a slow process, and um, you know, uh, if you're not willing to do it, then just put your money in an index fund. Interesting, interesting. And you know, I want to go back to uh, something we touched on earlier, Jack, which is I know something near and dear to your heart: that the funding landscape uh, for new traders out there. We have a lot of new traders in our audience. We also have a lot of experienced traders, people who are former, you know, SIBO market makers and everything else, who are also out there having a hard time uh, trying to find funding. Because as you might imagine, a, a decades of floor trading experience doesn't really count from an overall uh, time frame perspective when you're going out and looking for investors for a new fund, let's say. Obviously, this year, 2020, has added a number of interesting new wrinkles to the market there, of course, from looking for funding, of course, the pandemic and the election and the volatility and everything else we've seen going on out there. So from your frame of reference, you've been doing this for a while now, Jack, you, of course, have been running Fund Cedar for a number of years. How does 2020 shape up from an overall landscape for funding for new traders? Is it extremely challenging? Have you found a lot of the traditional sources of capital a little bit tighter this year? Or is it maybe the opposite? They're out there looking for new managers because there's so much volatility out there, Jack. Well, there was a time in my life when I was an allocator or worked for an allocator in a hedge fund advisory firm. Uh, but, you know, at this point, Fund Cedar is not a direct allocator. Uh, again, as I said, you know, our, our strategy is to partner with very large allocators. And, uh, you know, so I haven't been trying to place money or anything like that. So I am not actually up to date on what the current environment is. But indeed, Fund Cedar's purpose is to give those people who don't have the connections, who aren't in the right country, who don't have the pedigree of an Ivy League college, but all they can do is trade. <laughs> I laugh at that, but, you know, uh, that Fund Cedar would at least offer an opportunity to be able to monetize that, not through Fund Cedar's allocation. We're a technology company, not a money management company. But uh, but through the process of our connecting the database with allocators. Jack, we announced you're going to be on. We opened it up to our audience here to see if they had any questions for you as well. Apparently, we have a, a legion of undiscovered market wizards in our audience, Jack, because you have a lot of them saying you haven't contacted them yet, including uh, Christopher Retro here and a few others. So clearly, Jack, we have all of your new market wizards lurking in our audience, sir. You just haven't found them yet. Well, <laughs> they can find me, you know, so it's uh, – uh, and although, you know, I'm not doing another, for now, I would say the best thing to do is if you can link the account, if, uh, if not to Fund Cedar, if not, just upload the data because when searches are done, we'll, we'll also search the unverified database, uh, which are non-linked accounts. But of course, the verified have greater credibility to start. But in any case, getting the uh, numbers there uh, through our software, we can do searches like, you know, if, uh, you know, every trader with a Sortino ratio of, let's say, greater than two and more than five years of trading and uh, no drawdown of less than 20%. And you can put that in as an example and it'll give you a list of the traders that fit that. So, so uh, you know, our, our software is set up to search the database for, for, you know, not for ourselves, but for partnering allocators and, you um, and so one, you know, no promises here, but at least that there's a potential there for people who do have good track record, real track records, not simulated ones, uh, to uh, to be discovered uh, where in, in the normal world they might not be. There you go. Jack has already built a platform for you guys to go do just that. So you don't have to just harangue them on this show. You can go enter your results and let people see for yourselves. Obviously, we have a lot of fans of your books here in our audience, too, Jack. I'll just look at a couple here, like Rocky888. He says, your technical analysis book, I read at age 19. It was an amazing book. Thank you. Actually, I read all of your books and a bunch of XOs. So a lot of your fans floating around in our audience as well, Jack. I appreciate that. 
Unfortunately, Jack, that music means we've come to the end of our allotted time here this week on the old Options Insider radio program. But before we go, if perhaps you want to leave our audience a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease, maybe something you forgot to mention about unknown market wizards, maybe there's another book you have on the horizon up your sleeve you want to tease them with, or maybe some upcoming developments over there in the land of Fun Cedar. Now is the time, Jack. The floor is yours. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, no upcoming book uh, right now. Um, as far as uh, unknown market wizards, I would just say that the biggest surprise for me doing the book was that I thought it was impossible to get track records like some of the original market wizards got in the 1970s when we had this tremendous inflation and big one way markets and quantification hadn't really taken over the markets. So I thought that was a different world and no longer would I see incredible track records. And so I was proven wrong in doing this book. So it's still apparently poss- possible to do extraordinarily well, even in more modern markets. Uh, as far as Fun Cedar, the, uh, the uh, main potential is, as I said, we're currently in talks with some major alloc- allocators. And if those go through, uh, one or two of those go through, then uh, uh, Fun Cedar will be taking the next step of not only providing the platform for traders, but then acting as the conduit between traders and allocators. And that was always the plan. And uh, we, as I said, we are not investors ourselves, but it's just a matter of providing the database to those people that are allocators. Well, there you go. Listeners, check them out for yourselves. Sounds like we have a lot of market wizards in our audience. You can reach out to Jack over there. On the old Twitters, at Jack Schwager, S-C-H-W-A-G-E-R, is his handle over there. Of course, if you want to enter your results for yourselves, you know where to go. Fundseeder.com is the place to go. Enter your results. Put the track record up there. Maybe use some of those tools Jack was just alluding to. Who knows? Maybe some of these new allocators he's talking about, maybe they'll come knocking on your door in the near future. But in the meantime, Jack, I want to thank you for joining us out there. I always enjoy the Markets Wizard series. I'll look forward to reading this new one. I will look forward to chatting with you again in the near future, sir. Sure. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark. And thanks all of you out there for joining us live and indeed after the fact. Remember, it's not just interviews here. On the network course, we have Education Wednesday coming up tomorrow with Options Boot Camp and Options Playbook Radio. Thursday, of course, has TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, as well as Episode 2 of the Option Block. Friday, Volatility View is going to have an Advisor's Option sneaking in there sometime this week as well. So a lot of great content poised for you coming up. And, of course, we'll be back again next interview Tuesday with another episode of Options Insider Radio. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>